from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and I am the host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. I want to give a shout out to some of my patrons, Emily, Gabrielle, Emma, Galen, Cassandra, David, John, and my girl Judy. Thank you guys so, so much. So this podcast is going to be on Gary Heidnick. It goes without saying that this one needs a disclaimer, disclaimer, because there are parts that are rather disturbing. He came highly, highly requested. So let's get into it. Gary Michael Heidnick was born on November 22nd, 1943 in Eastlake, Ohio. So let's get into some history for that time. It was this year that the Pentagon, the world's largest office building, had completed construction in the U.S. Canned foods, meat, cheese, butter, and cooking oils began being rationed. The United States and the United Kingdom met to discuss the future invasion of France for World War II during the Quebec Conference. German forces liquidated the Jewish ghetto in Krakow, Poland, though there was a ghetto uprising in Warsaw. Mussolini resigned in Italy and surrendered. More than 2,000 Budapest citizens were sent to concentration camps. The Moscow declarations were signed at the Moscow Conference. The Declaration of the Four Nations was signed by the United States, Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and Nationalist China, and it recognized that the war would not end until the Axis powers submitted to an unconditional surrender. The Declaration of Italy stated that fascism would end in favor of democratic institutions created by the Italian people. The Declaration of Austria declared the German annexation to be null and that Austria should be freed at the end of the war. Finally, the Declaration of Atrocities stated that Germans who had participated in committing atrocities would be punished by the nations where the acts were committed or by a joint decision of the governments of the Allies. Due to several failures and unfortunate neglectfulness by British leaders, a massive famine hit India. This famine lasted for an entire year, and it would leave three million people dead. But on a more positive note, the Golden Globe Awards began this year. Frank Sinatra was one of the most popular entertainers at the time, Oklahoma the Musical opened on Broadway, and some notable people born this year were Chevy Chase, Janis Joplin, Robert De Niro, George Harrison, Jim Morrison, and Oliver North. So this was the atmosphere that Gary was born into. Gary's parents were Michael Heidnick and Ellen Chanel. Michael himself was born in 1912 in Cleveland, Ohio, and his father had actually been born in Yugoslavia. Gary's niece stated in a future interview that the family was also Pennsylvania Dutch, Irish, and German, but I couldn't definitively find which side. Michael and Ellen married in June of 1940 and had Gary three years later. When Gary was just three years old himself, the couple had another son they named 
Terry, and it wasn't long after that they decided to divorce. Now, the divorce is said to be the result of Michael's domestic abuse and Ellen's alcoholism, though Michael was also described as an alcoholic. Three-year-old Gary and his still infant brother Terry, of course, went to live with their mother and their father went on to marry another woman. So during the about four years or so that the boys lived with their mother, Gary climbed a tree and then fell 20 feet to the ground below. This, of course, left him with a rather significant head injury that forever altered the shape of his head. So the kids at his elementary school started calling him football head. It was also said that his personality was forever changed after this accident and that he became more violent. Animals were something that Gary used to love. Then after this, he started hanging them from trees. Now their mother would remarry and sometimes have other boyfriends. And when Gary was around eight years old or so, the brothers went to live with their father and stepmother. Immediately, his father was angered at the fact that Gary still wet the bed, especially at his age. Gary would later say that his father humiliated him by making him hang his soiled sheets outside of his bedroom window for the world to see. And on a couple of occasions when his father was extra angry, he would hang Gary by his ankles out of the window. You see, all of this was to try to cure him from wetting the bed. Both Gary and Terry, neither one got along with their stepmother, and it was glaringly obvious that no matter the situation, and even if his boys were right, he always took his wife's side. Now, in a later interview with Terry, he said that their father frequently beat them. He said, quote, It got to the point where we'd be afraid to pick anything up because he'd beat us if we dropped something like a glass or something. I was knocked unconscious once." Another story from Terry says that their father forced the boys to wear pants that had some sort of bullseye on the back of them and then their father would derive great pleasure as well as the neighborhood kids in kicking them in their bottoms. Now in school, Gary really didn't seem to have anything to do with his peers, even refusing to make eye contact. When one girl who really meant no harm asked him about a specific homework assignment, he exclaimed to her that she was not worthy enough to talk to him. During this time, his IQ was tested at 148, which is very, very gifted. At some point, they went back to live with their mother and then back again with their father, and I believe that was because their mother had been arrested for theft. So at 14 years old and under the pressure of his father to make the decision, Gary was enrolled at the Staunton Military Academy in Staunton, Virginia. Founded in 1884, it was a private boys' school and was highly respected for its academics and military programs. In fact, some notable American political and military leaders graduated from there, including 1964 presidential candidate Barry Goldwater and John Dean, who would later be implicated in the Watergate scandal under Nixon. Now, it would later have to close due to many issues, and one of them being that they refused to racially integrate. They would not allow black students to go to the school, although they would allow admission of Asians and Hispanics. But while Gary was there, it was considered a reputable school, but he promptly left school before his graduation, instead re-enrolling in public high school. He dropped out at 17 years old and joined the army. And that was his childhood, so let's unpack. Now, clearly Gary's parents were ill-equipped to properly care for children. Both parents were described as alcoholics. 
Growing up with substance abusing parents leaves children often feeling like they will never know what to expect from one day to the next. Instead of parents being sources of wisdom and nurturing, a lot of children have to survive with adults who are violent, unpredictable, and generally given into their own impulses and desires. Inconsistencies, unreliability, and chaos are just the very tame issues in these homes. Children of alcoholics most often do not get their emotional needs met, and this often leads to poor behavior and difficulties in properly caring for themselves and their feelings later in life. These children often have to push their own feelings of sadness and fear and anger in order to feel like they can survive. These feelings, in turn, most often resurface in adulthood. They also tend to show difficulties in following projects through to the end. They lie when telling the truth would be just as easy, and they have difficulty relaxing and having fun. They take themselves very seriously, they have difficulties with intimate relationships, and feel that they are indeed different from their peers and can be quite impulsive. In summation, according to Psychology Today, the mental trauma for children is so severe that it is at least comparable to what soldiers suffer in combat. And then of course we have toddler Gary witnessing the domestic abuse inflicted upon his mother by his father, which is a whole other can of worms. And then we have the head injury, right? So much like Alexander Pachushkin, after Gary suffered his head trauma from falling from the tree, his personality had changed. According to Science Daily, childhood brain injuries, including concussions, are associated with an increased risk of subsequent mental illness, poor school attainment, and premature death. Now, people who had experienced a moderate or severe brain injury during childhood were at twice the risk of being admitted to hospital as a mental health inpatient and were 50% more likely to use a mental health service than unaffected people in the same age group, according to a study out of Oxford University. Yet another study examined head injuries before the age of 10, which I believe was the case with Gary, played increased hyperactivity and inattention, as well as conduct disorder after the age of 10, as reported by parents and teachers. Psychosocial deficits were more prevalent in the children who had to be admitted as inpatient due to the injury. And then we go right into the humiliation that Gary's father seemed to love to inflict upon him. Shaming and humiliating a child can have long-term devastating results. An article written for Psychology Today suggests that adult children raised by narcissistic parents frequently tell similar childhood stories of shame and humiliation, and it is most assuredly emotional abuse. And we already know how detrimental physical abuse is on children. And a side note, his father completely denied ever physically abusing Gary or teaching him to be a racist, which will come in soon enough. So Gary then isolated himself socially, not knowing how to relate to the world around him and his own peers. I would gather that military school might have been a reprieve from his home life. My friends, how exactly was Gary supposed to grow up to be a well-adjusted, happy adult? So let's continue. During basic training for the army, Gary's drill sergeant marked him as quote, excellent. He wanted to be a specialist and applied for several positions, including military police, but he was rejected. Instead, he was sent to San Antonio, Texas to train as a medic and actually excelled at his medical training. Gary was then stationed in Germany where he served at the 46th Army Surgical Hospital in 1962. And for once, life was going pretty well for Gary, really. 
He found brotherhood and structure in the military that he so desperately needed. And then something changed. Gary had told some later acquaintances that the army had forced him to take LSD while he was stationed in Germany. He said this, in turn, caused him to have a legitimate nervous breakdown. He started calling out of work, stating he was sick. He complained of headaches and nausea, dizziness and blurred vision. He was diagnosed with gastroenteritis, which for those of you who might not know, it's an inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. But as also noted by the doctors that Gary was displaying some form of mental illness and they prescribed him Stelazine. So Stelazine is an antipsychotic used to treat schizophrenia, but it can be used in the short term for generalized anxiety. At 19 years old, he was transferred back to the United States to a military hospital in Pennsylvania and while there, he was officially diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder and was then honorably discharged from the military with a full disability pension to go with it. So schizoid personality disorder displays itself as a sort of pattern of indifference to social relationships, having limited range of emotional expression and experience. These people rarely feel that there is anything wrong with their behavior or how they perceive things. This disorder manifests itself by early adulthood through social and emotional detachments that prevent people from having close relationships according to psychology today. So some of the symptoms of this personality disorder include no desire for close relationships, comes across as aloof and detached, and avoid social activities that involve significant contact with other people. They almost always choose solitary activities and have little or no interest in sexual experiences. They have no real bond or connection with family and they even exhibit little observable changes in their overall mood. And though the cause is not entirely known, there is a higher risk of developing schizoid personality disorder if there are family members who have illnesses on the schizophrenic spectrum. In 1964, a now 21-year-old Gary decided he wanted to become a nurse and enrolled in nursing classes in Philadelphia, completing them the next year. He was awarded an internship at Philadelphia General Hospital, but left after only one month. He then went to work at a VA hospital, but was fired for displaying rude behavior towards the other patients. So it was then, from this point until the late 80s, that Gary was kind of in and out of psychiatric hospitals. It was reported that he also suffered greatly with extreme bouts of depression and attempted to commit suicide at least 13 times during this year span as well. His brother Terry reported that he too suffered from schizophrenia and was in and out of hospitals and tried to kill himself on several occasions throughout the years as well. In 1967, Gary bought a three-story house and began to visit the Elwin Institute, which was a house for the developmentally disabled. Then, in 1970, Ellen, his mother, who was also battling depression and bone cancer, along with the effects of long-term alcohol abuse, committed suicide by drinking mercuric chloride, which would be a most unpleasant way to go. So then the next year, Gary said he heard the voice of God telling him to form a church and that he named the church United Church of the Ministries of God. And this is not to be confused with the actual United Church of the Ministers of God because there is one and they're legit. He, I don't know if he copied the name. I'm not sure what that's about. What he did do is refer to himself as Brother Bishop and he had all of about five followers each of which was mentally disabled. He then actually, kind of smartly, went to Merrill Lynch and opened a bank account in the church's name. 
His initial deposit was $1,500, which was a chunk of change for that time. And that would actually grow to have a balance of over half a million dollars, which is the equivalent of $5.4 million today. By the 80s, this church was thriving and very wealthy, but keep in mind, he was still in and out of psychiatric hospitals during all of this time as well. At some point, Gary had a child with a woman, though the baby was given up for foster care shortly after the birth due to the mother's mental capacity. In 1976, he sold his house and purchased another one that was three stories. Gary rented out the top two floors and he lived on the main floor himself. The house also had a basement. And it was also in 1976 that Gary was charged with aggravated assault and carrying an unlicensed gun after shooting at one of his tenants and grazing his face. In 1978, he had already been dating a woman named Anne Jeanette Davidson who was also mentally disabled with an IQ of 48. He moved her in with him in his house. He promptly got her pregnant and the baby girl was taken away for the same reason as his first. But this year he decided to pay a visit to Anjanette's little sister, Alberta, who also lived in a mental health facility. He signed her out on a day pass and then kept her a prisoner in a locked storage room of his basement where he repeatedly beat and raped her. So for 10 days he held her there. The police were called and it was noted that Gary was the last person to sign her out. So they went to Gary's house where they discovered her there and returned her to the inpatient hospital. She was then examined and was found out to have been sodomized, raped, and had contracted gonorrhea. Gary was arrested and charged with kidnapping, rape, unlawful restraint, false imprisonment, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and interfering with the custody of a committed person. Now get this. He was sentenced to prison, but during an appeal, the sentence was overturned. He spent three years of some of this time in a mental institution, and he was released in April of 1983. But, you know, of course, under the watch of a state-controlled mental health program. He then began writing to a woman named Betty who was living in the Philippines. He had met her through a matrimony service, hoping to find a wife. She knew nothing about him save what he said in his letters, but she came to the United States in September of 1985 and they were married the next month. Gary was now 42 years old. This marriage was a short one due to the fact that she caught him having sex with other women and he even forced her to watch. Betty also accused him of raping and beating her repeatedly. She fled for what I assume was her life. She fled back to her home country, pregnant with his child. She named the baby boy Jesse John Disto. Okay, so that was the nicer part of the story. Things are going to get much more rough from here on out, okay? So now at this point, he had 100% planned on continuing his criminal sexual activities, only now he was quite determined to not get caught. His church was not really gaining followers to his satisfaction and he made the decision to keep sex slaves to reproduce quickly so that he could have the large following that he wanted. But first, to gather the women. Now, Gary had a pension for women of African descent. When acquaintances would ask him why he always dated black girls, he said because they were nicer and more obedient than white girls and that they also expected less. So there's that. He abducted 25-year-old Josefina Riviera in November of 1986. She was a sex worker who was also addicted to drugs. He got her to come home with him where he then took her down to the basement and then he chained her up. She later said that he put crazy glue into the lock so that she would not be able to pick them. 
She said he also told her that he was going to get her pregnant but raise the baby himself. Then only three days later, he chained 24-year-old Sandra Lindsay, another mentally disabled girl, in his basement. He had picked her up while she was walking to the store. He then raped each girl and forced the other to watch. According to Josephina, Gary brought Sandra a Christmas card and forced her to write, quote, Dear Mom, I am all right. Don't worry. Love, Sandy. Unquote. He then, with a gloved hand, handed her a $20 bill for her to place inside of the card as he would not physically touch the money himself. The next month, just before Christmas of 1986, he saw 19-year-old single mother Lisa Thomas walking in the cold and he offered to give her a ride. He treated her to lunch and asked if she wanted to go to his house to drink some wine. She agreed and then he drugged her wine and when she became unconscious, he carried her down to the basement. He raped her while she was still unconscious and chained her with the other girls. Only a week later, he brought home 23-year-old Deborah Dudley. Now, this girl fought hard against her abductor and attacker and was beaten far worse than the others because of it. But her constant yelling that she needed feminine supplies and whatnot forced Gary to purchase at least a portable toilet for the women and toiletries, so there's that. In all, a total of six women were abducted, taken down to the basement, where all manner of torture was afflicted upon them. He barely fed them, and they nearly starved to death. Gary also dug pits in the floor of the basement. Now, the diagrams that I looked up made it appear to be about three to four feet deep or so, just enough for a couple of girls to lay down with knees bent inside, not really near enough room to like sit comfortably all the way up. If one of the girls was being especially ill-behaved, he would put them in the pit that he dug. He would then cover the whole of the pit with like plywood and something very heavy that they couldn't push off. And then, once he realized that they could hear his coming and going, he decided to use a screwdriver to break their eardrums to solve that problem. He would sometimes put the girls in these pits and fill it with water, barely leaving enough room for them to breathe, or he would even send electric currents through the water to electrocute them. The torture these girls endured is unimaginable. He also fed them dog food, and when Sandra Lindsay angered him once, he hung her by only one wrist from a beam in the ceiling for two whole days. She had no food, no water, and developed a high fever and then died one morning. Then allegedly, he carried her body upstairs, used a power saw to dismember her, and put her head into a cooking pot to boil. He then filleted the meat and fed part of it to his dogs and then supposedly fed the rest of it to the other girls in the basement. Now, either one of his tenants or a possible neighbor began to complain about the stench coming out of his house, so the police showed up and asked him about it, and he said, oh, I just burnt some food, no problem. So they said, okay, have a good day. He then successfully turned the girls all against each other. The first girl he kidnapped was successfully able to convince Gary that she was on his side and helped him torture the other girls. Now, due to this, she was, on occasion, allowed to accompany him upstairs and would be allowed to sit and watch a movie with him. In March of 1987, he killed Deborah Dudley by electrocuting her in the water-filled pit. Finally, Toward the end of March, Josephina, his first kidnapping victim, asked if she could be allowed to visit her family. For whatever reason, he agreed and drove her to a gas station near where she said her family lived and told her that he would wait for her in the car there in the parking lot. 
She walked a block away just out of visual range and immediately called 911. When the police came, the marks on her ankles and wrists were enough for them to go arrest Gary, who was still waiting in the parking lot. So when his home was searched, the police were completely floored with what they saw. Never mind the girls chained to each other, to the floor, the pits, and all of that. What was really interesting was that he had dollar bills taped along the walls of a hallway and pennies also glued to the walls. He barely had any furniture and what he did have was old, tattered, and falling apart. Not long after his arrest, Gary tried to hang himself in his jail cell. An assessment of his property and money in his account, which again was over half a million dollars, they then used that to prove that he was, in fact, not insane during the time he kept these women captive. Now, Gary tried to say that the women were already in the house when he moved into it, which is, of course, ridiculous. He was sentenced to death by lethal injection, which was carried out in 1999. He was 55 years old. Four of the six abducted girls did survive. The pit that he dug was used as inspiration in the movie Silence of the Lambs. Now, Gary's case is so complex, right? What he did is, of course, undeniably wrong. As the case with Richard Chase and others, what was genetically already potentially there might have been brought forth with the use of LSD. This would have been on top of the rather severe head injury Gary suffered as a child. Multiply that by humiliation, child abuse, witnessing domestic abuse, alcoholic parents. I mean, I have a hard time saying that his life could have turned out like completely normal and average. Yes, there are plenty of people that experience these things too, but very rarely ever in this exact combination. But again, this is just my opinion. What do you think? Leave me a comment below if you're watching the video or DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. You can email me at serialkillinginstagram at gmail.com and consider becoming a patron so that I may be able to in the future give you much more frequent content. Most importantly, thank you so, so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I truly appreciate that. Thank you guys. Have a great day.